Okay, folks, so again, this is chapter 21 or unit 21, elements and arthropod vectors. So um, we, we've had a little bit of background with a parasitic helminth, the Tamia solium, the pork tapeworm, and certainly we've had some background with regard to arthropod vectors. So we're just going to review and then add a few more parasitic worms and um, um, arthropod vectors. So as always, folks, classification will be really important. You want to be able to, ident to identify and classify the helminths and the vectors. Um, with regard to the um, parasitic worms, the helminths, you'll want to know life cycles, right? How we get infected, um, what, how you would diagnose the infection, right? If you have a patient. Um, transmission is really important, like how did your patient get infected? Um, and again, we will want to be able to identify all the different stages and life cycles, all right? So this is a concept map, folks, with regard to one way to classify our helminths or parasitic worms. So we can divide them into two big categories based on um, their body type. So the platyhelminths are also called flatworms because if we took a platyhelminth and we cut it in cross-section, the body looks flat, and hence flatworms. And within platyhelminths, there's two big groups, and we, we're only going to focus on one. The group we're going to focus on are called the cestodes, or tapeworms, because they grow in little, little segments, little proglottids. And we already know the one cestode that we would ask you on lab exam, too, and that's tamia solium. What's the common name for tamia solium? The pork tapeworm. Good. And we'll come back and talk about the, the life cycle and transmission. The second group of pl platy helminths are called the trematodes, and the common name is fluke. Now, we used to, um, in lab, we used to talk about the blood fluke schistosoma, which causes schistosomiasis, but I've deleted it, folks. It's, it is really important, um, but I've deleted it just because we have, I've added some other information, so we won't be looking at schistosoma. Unless you want to, I can go through it with you. It's a fascinating life cycle, but it will not be on our lab exam too. And then folks, we're gonna back up. Again, we're going back to all the helminths, and a really big group are the so-called nematodes. And again, folks, if we took a nematode and we cut it in cross-section, the body looks round. And hence, a common name for nematodes are roundworms. And most of our helminths are gonna be roundworms. So we're going to be looking at the human roundworm, Ascaris lumbricoides. Then we're going to look at the um, parasitic helminth that causes lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. And then we'll finish with a, um, another nematode called trichinella um, that can also be um, transmitted by eating undercooked pork, walrus, um, or bear meat. All right. So folks, again, um, we're kind of working through your, your worksheet at this point. So we're going to start out with um, Tania solium. So folks, um, let me quiz you as we go. Is Tania solium a cestode, a trematode, or a nematode? A cestode. And what's the common name for a cestode? Tapeworm, right? And the reason is they grow in these little segments, and they can, they can grow to several feet in length. And I think people thought that they almost looked like a tape measure you would use in carpentry or in sewing, and, and hence tapeworm. The head is called the scolex, right? And on the scolex, there are hooks and suckers that the adults use to attach to the inside of our intestine. That's where the adults are going to grow. And as they grow, they, they form these little segments called proglottids. And the function of the per perglottids is to form hundreds and thousands of eggs. So as a tapeworm grows, the perglottids at the very end are going to be chock full of mature eggs. The perglottid will break off and be passed in the feces. And when the perglottid dries up, it will break open, releasing the eggs. So folks, we, we know from our previous um, cast of characters, one way we can, we can get infected with Tania solium, the pork tapeworm, is through ingesting pork that has a little resting stage in it, the cystocercus. But there's a second way we can get infected, and how is that? Fecal oral, right? So if we're drinking fecal contaminated food or water, we swallow the eggs, the eggs pass through the stomach, they enter the intestine where they hatch, releasing little baby um, worms we call larvae. 
the larva penetrate the intestine, get into the um, capillaries, the bloodstream, and then they're, they travel throughout the body. One place they love to go is to the brain. And in the brain, they'll form those little cystocerci that we looked at in the cast of characters. Yeah. So if people are getting, um, if people are um, swallowing lots and lots of teniosolium eggs, they can end up with massive numbers of cystocerci in the brain. And do you think that could cause damage? Yeah, really, really bad damage. So when you have cystocerci in the brain, it's referred to as neurocystocercosis. And worldwide, it's one of the leading um, parasitic infections of the central nervous system. And um, furthermore, and I, I didn't realize this before putting the, um, the worksheet together, it's a leading cause of epilepsy worldwide, right? Now, folks, do you think you would ever see here in Northern California working in the hospitals or the medical clinics, do you think you would ever see cases of neurocystocercosis? Yeah, yeah, your colleagues from previous classes who've been working in local hospitals, um, there have been three of your colleagues reported that, they, that their hospitals had seen cases of neurocystocercosis. So this is something you might see. So you guys, um, so with regard to diagnosis, one way to diagnose is to take a fecal smear and look for the aches, right? So again, you guys, you're gonna be looking at fecal smears today. Let me just go forward one. So in the fecal smear, folks, what I always look for are nice round eggs. They aren't, they aren't bumpy. And here it's hard to see, folks, but if you use fine focus, it has what's called a striated border, little lines radiating out. Right, so that's kind of classic for the Tania solium eggs, right? And now we're gonna back up. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong one. Okay, so we could find um, eggs in a fecal smear, right? But um, the other infectious form, again, folks, what's the other infectious form? That little resting cystocercus, right? So if pigs eat the eggs in fecal contaminated garbage, you know, um, the, then in the pig muscle, there'll be that little resting stage of cystocercus. Then if we eat tissue from that pig without cooking it properly and we swallow the cystocercus, right, it's going to make its way through the stomach to the intestine where it will emerge. And again, using the scolex attached to the inside of our intestine and start growing into an adult. So you guys, what are the two infectious forms then of taniosolium? The egg, right, fecal oral, and that's really bad news because that's when we can end up with neurocystocercosis. And what's the second infectious form? The cystocercus, right, in undercooked pork, right? And if we ate the cystocercus, what do we end up with? Adults living in our intestine, right? And then we become a reservoir of the eggs, right? Okay, let me see here. What else do we have here? Okay, and then folks, this is a, um, pathology sample, this is a cross-section through the brain of a person that possibly died of neurocystocercosis. And you guys, what are these little round structures, do you think? That's the cystocerci, right? That little resting larva. And you can see how much damage is done, right? So especially when people don't have access to clean drinking water and food, this can be a real problem. Yeah. So Right, yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah, no, that's a really, really good question. So we want to remember with the neurocystocercosis, this is from fecal oral transmission, right? But um, it is a really important point because we're going to talk about another parasite that's transmitted in undercooked pork. So there is inspectors, like at the time of slaughter, they'll be inspecting the carcass, right? Um, and I'm actually not sure if, like, the pig producers, if, they, if they're screening all the time for the presence of taniosolium. I would think yes. I would think they are screening. Maybe that's something I can try to look into. Um, I think probably um, for, like, folks living in California, probably a big risk is when we go traveling, right? And so, for example, when we travel to Malaysia, 
we have to be really careful about fecal contamination of water and food, right? So I'm thinking that the biggest danger would be if you're traveling and visiting areas where there is potential fecal contamination of food or water, that would be, probably be the biggest risk factor for acquiring um, the neurocystis sarcosis, right? And especially if you're visiting areas where you know a lot of pigs are being raised, for example. Um, but again, the screening here in the United States, let me check into that because that's such a great question. Um, one thing I was taught um, when we were growing up, my mom was raised on a, on a ranch, on a farm, and she taught us you never eat pork rare. Never medium rare, it's never pink, right? So even way back in the, the old days, people were aware of the dangers of undercooked pork, right? And we'll see not only is it taming solely, but trichinella spiralis, yeah. Yeah, good question. Public health microbiologist, <laughs> good job. Okay, so, and, and this folks, again, you're gonna be looking at the cystocerecus. It should look familiar because we have it in the cast of characters. And this is just a histopath, um, thin section through muscle that's been stained, looking at it with a light microscope, just showing the cystocerecus. Um, we wouldn't show this, you guys, on the lab exam, but certainly we could show the cystocerecus. Certainly we could show the um, pathology um, um, in neurocystocercosis. Okay, and again, folks, do remember, you will potentially see cases of neurocystocercosis here in California. Okay, and again, just more the neurocystocercosis. All right, and again, folks, um, just to try to speed this up, I'm going to... This is just from your handout, so I'm going to let you read the pages in the handout. Uh, and we're just going to keep going here. Okay, folks, so Taney Solium, again, really, really quick quiz, you guys. Cestode, trematode, or nematode? Cestode, good. Um, what is the scientific name of the pork tapeworm, and meaning the genus and specific epithet? Taney Solium, good job, you guys. Name two ways we can get infected. Fecal oral swallowing the... Eggs, good. Not good, but yes, you're right. And what would be the consequence if we swallow the taniosolium eggs? What could be a really bad consequence? Yeah, the neurocystocercosis, good. What's another way we can get infected? Why is it called the pork tapeworm? Yeah, if we eat undercooked pork, and what's the infectious stage in the undercooked pork? The cystocercus, right? So you guys, what would be the consequence of swallowing the cystocercus? Then you're gonna have adult tapeworms living in your intestine, right? Because, so then you become a reservoir of you know, the eggs. And also folks, if it was a little child that maybe doesn't have good bathroom um, hygiene habits, right? If they defecate and there could be eggs in the feces and they, they're not washing their hands well, right? And there's feces on their fingers, right? They could self inoculate. Or you know how little kids like to poke their fingers in your mouth, right? Or their friend's mouth, right? So they could inoculate you know, family or friends, okay. All right, folks, so we're going to move to the next parasitic helmet. And this is a pretty common parasitic helmet that we have it um, here in the United States. And I think um, probably southeastern United States, there might be higher prevalence. And one reason is, is just the weather, you know, nice, um, warm, moist weather, right? That helps the eggs survive in the soil for long periods of time. So this is the start of our nematodes. What's a common name for nematodes? Roundworms, right? Good. And the first nematode is Aspergillus lumpicoides. And you guys are going to love this. Right after breakfast, right after breakfast, here are our adults, Aspergillus lumpicoides. I always think of them, they look like spaghetti to me. And then I can't think of Aspergillus when I'm eating spaghetti. Yeah? Okay, but these are adult roundworms. They live in the intestine. What do you think transmission is? Fecal oral, yes, you guys. So the male and females, they live in our intestine. The female lays eggs, and the eggs are going to be passed where? In the feces, yeah? So is one um, sample you take from your patient maybe feces and do a fecal smear, right, and look for eggs? Okay, so remember, you guys, for our, on our parasites, parasitic helmets, we're going to look at fecal samples for both teneosolium and for... Ascaris lumbricoides, okay? And folks, with the Ascaris lumbricoides, there's a, a variety of appearances to the eggs depending on if they've been fertilized or not fertilized. 
The classic one I would put on our lab exam, folks, is going to be one that looks like maybe this or that or these. They're golden brown, stained from bile, and, folks, a significant difference compared to the Taneasolium eggs. They have these little bumps on the outside. They're bumpy on the outside, right? Which one did you see outside? Oh, like these golden brown ones, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And not only are they golden brown, but they have these bumps on the outside, okay? And that would be one way to distinguish them from the Taneasolium eggs. The Taneasolium eggs are smooth on the outside. They have those little striations, okay? So the... Um, um, the life cycle, you guys, is really fascinating. So the eggs are shed in feces, and wherever the feces goes, the eggs go. They can remain infectious for weeks, maybe months, in the soil. So once soil is contaminated, right, it can remain a source of the ascaris eggs for long periods of time. So if we swallow the eggs, feed with contaminated food or water, the eggs hatch in the intestine, releasing the little baby worms called larvae. And this is fascinating. The larvae penetrate the intestine, they penetrate into the blood vessels and are carried up to the lungs. And um, when they reach the lungs, they exit the blood vessels and they penetrate through the alveolar walls of the lungs. So they're going to get into the lungs and then they migrate up our trachea. They're crawling up the trachea and you might feel it is like just a tickling sensation. So what do you do if you have the tickle in the back of your throat? <laughs> and swallow. So we swallow them because ultimately they need to get where? To the intestine, yeah? And so into the intestine they, they grow, they mature into the adults, right? And the male and the female, they, they have sexual reproduction. Um, the fertilized eggs are shed in the feces and again we, we complete the cycle. So it's possible, folks, if um, um, a person has just a few adults, you might not even know it, right? But what's really, really serious is, again, folks, if people don't have access to clean drinking water and food, and there's a lot of contamination of food and water with ascaris eggs, they can get so many adults <coughs> in the intestine, what could happen? They could block the intestine, right? Which is truly life-threatening. So again, this is why clean, clean um, drinking water, clean food is so important worldwide, yeah? Um, over on um, bench four, there's a photograph, again, of a blocked intestine, and it was a pathology sample from a little child. And it doesn't say if that's what killed the child, but it, there's a good chance it could, right, if it's not caught in time. And the other issue, you guys, is in areas where people don't have enough good food to eat, the parasites are competing with the humans for nutrients. And this is really important in babies and little children, right, that are trying to grow. If already their diet isn't that great and then they have this heavy parasite load, that could, that could um, cause a failure to thrive, failure to grow, right? It will impact them physically and mentally and emotionally, right? So these can be really serious issues worldwide. Yeah? Is that the same as uh, the parvo for dogs? Parvo, okay, so parvo is a virus, so the pathogen is different. Um, but the, um, in parvo, um, it will replicate in the intestines and it can cause a really severe, profound diarrhea. So you can lose your dogs from dehydration, right? But it's a virus, so it's not going to cause a physical blockage, right? But the same idea, right? Pathology to the intestine, yeah. It's a good point. And folks, again, I, and, and I know you probably get tired of my stories, and my poor husband, he's such a rich source of stories. So when he was growing up, he grew up in Malaysia in the tropics, right? And they lived in an area where they didn't have electricity, they didn't have indoor plumbing, right? Um, and that was back in the day when human feces was collected for what? For fertilizer on the fields, right? So he's shared, he remembers a, a man would come around and collect the night soil. What's night soil? Feces, yeah. And then that would be used in the, the fields. So you guys, if, if you can imagine if there's somebody in the community that's infected with ascaris, right, their feces are being collected, what's in the feces? The, the eggs, yeah. And then they're spread in the fields. And what if you're a farmer, a farming family, or just a kid playing in the fields, what could happen? Right, you could get contaminated, your fingers could get contaminated, right? Um, and so that, that um, puts you at much higher risk for infection, right? So 
this, the story that I, I love to hear my husband's story. So when they were growing up, he was the eldest of eight kids. They didn't have individual beds. They'd have a big sleeping platform that everybody slept on. They have mosquito nets, right, because they have malaria. And he shared that during the night, you know, he and his brothers and sisters, during the night they'd be going, <coughs> my ascaras. <coughs> anyway, all right. So not good, right? <coughs> and certainly, folks, if there's a lot of um, ingestion of the eggs, not only would there be a worry of the adults, you know, if you, if you have the adults blocking the intestine, but it seems to me also with those larvae penetrating the lungs, that can't be good for the lungs either, right? But anyway, so just um, um, in another little connection there is when we visit his, his mother, who's like 90, and, in, and I know this is just a great tradition overall, but you never wear your street shoes into the house. And I was thinking, that makes sense, because if you're a farmer, right, you're out in the fields, um, and there's been hum human manure put on the fields, right, what's going to be on the bottom of your shoes? Feces, right? And you don't want to track that into the house, especially if you have little babies or little kids playing on the floor. So it's like, I'm always fascinated by how some of these cool habits how there might be a microbiology link to them, right? So I was like, that's so cool. Okay, um, so folks, Ascaris lumbricoides, what's the common name? Human roundworm, good. Um, how do we get infected? Fecal oral, what's the infectious stage? The egg, okay. Um, where do the larvae go when they hatch in the intestine? Bloodstream, lungs, crawl up. And then how do they get back to the intestine? We swallow them, good. Um, would light infections potentially be asymptomatic? Yeah, really light infections, you might not even know, right? But what would be your concern, folks, especially in children with heavy infections? Yeah, right, Incest intestinal blockage, obstruction, right? And also, if, if a kid isn't getting good nutrition, what's another kind of longer term issue? Failure to thrive, right? Yeah, the parasites are using a lot of the nutrients. Yeah, good, you guys. All right. The next nematode, folks, has a very different type of transmission. So remember the first two we talked about, Tania solium and Ascaris lumbricoides. They both can be transmitted fecal orally. Well, now, folks, we're looking at a nematode that has a totally different um, method of being transmitted. This is Wuchereria bancrofti. It causes the disease described as lymphatic filariasis. And folks from ANP, what's a common name for lymphatic filariasis? Elephantiasis, right? So we want to understand the transmission cycle and what kind of pathology, what kind of damage is that. So folks, um, Wuchereria bancrofti is, is transmitted by a mosquito. And this is fascinating, you guys. Depending on which area of the world you're in, it could be Aedes mosquitoes, it could be Anopheles mosquitoes, it could be Culex mosquitoes. So Wuchereri has adapted to a wide range of mosquitoes as their vectors. So um, we'll start with how the mosquito gets infected. Um, so the mosquito is going to bite a person that's already infected with Wuchereri bancrofti. The um, adult worms give birth to live babies, little larvae, that circulate in our, our bloodstream. These little babies are called microfilaria, and they're the diagnostic stage. One of the diagnostic stage is in lymphatic filariasis. Um, what we would do is take a blood sample at night, right? So it's interesting. When do most mosquitoes bite? at night, right? So if we're taking a peripheral blood sample, we take it at night because that's when the microfilaria are going to be in the peripheral bloodstream, the blood vessels of the arms, hands, legs, and feet, right? Um, so what we do is we take a sample, we make a smear, and look for these little larval worms in the blood smear, the microfilaria. So the microfilaria are the um, diagnostic stage. They're also the infectious stage for the mosquito. So when the female takes her blood meal, she gets infected with the, um, the microfilaria. They undergo development within the mosquito and eventually make it up to her, um, her feeding mouth parts so that when she takes another meal, she's going to inject the Wuchereria bancrofti into us. And so they first travel in the um, blood vessels and then eventually <coughs> they're going to get into the lymphatic vessels 
where they're going to grow into adults, right, start the cycle all over again, right, um, giving birth to the little microfilaria. Now, the problem is if we have chronic infections that don't get treated, we don't have any, we don't have any um, adult literary macrophage folks, but what we have is the dog equivalent that we have here in California. This is a filarial worm of dogs, and the scientific name, this is bonus, I, this would be totally bonus, you guys. The scientific name is Dirofilaria imidis, and the common name for the filarial disease caused by these um, filarial worms is dog heartworm. Where do you think the adults grow? In the heart, right? That's why it's called dog heartworm. And folks, the reason I wanted you to see the adults here, okay, is that if you can imagine um, adult Leucaria van Crofti living in your lymphatic vessels, right? They're going to cause inflammation. They're going to cause blockage. And that means that the um, lymph fluid um, can't return to your bloodstream, right? It's supposed to be constantly circulating, right? Lymphatic tissues, lymphatic vessels, blood, right? So if you have the adult worms growing in your lymphatic vessels, say of your legs, they're going to cause inflammation, they're going to cause blockage, and as a result, you're going to get swelling. Cause, um, swelling is called officially edema, right, because that lymphatic fluid isn't being circulated. And that's why in chronic infections, where the people haven't been treated properly, we'll get this swelling, edema of the legs. In men, it can be really horrible. Folks call it causing um, edema of the scrotum. And as a consequence, in a lot of a lot of communities, the people are shunned because they look different, right? We're so funny as humans. Like, if somebody looks different, we shun them, right? So you get ostracized. And then furthermore, you guys, is it going to be hard to walk and work? Yeah, right? So, um, and I would, I would think also with that increased pressure, right, <coughs> you're going to be blocking blood flow, right? Blood flow is going to be decreased. And that could lead to necrosis, or it could increase the risk for, um, say, secondary bacterial infections, right? So this is a nasty one, you guys, really, really nasty. Um, so you guys, in um, lymphatic filariasis, can you provide the scientific name for one of the helmets that causes lymphatic filariasis? Wuchereri van Crofti, good. What's the common name of the disease it causes? Elephantiasis, good. Um, what's the infectious stage for the mosquito? The, yeah, and, and probably you guys want to learn microfilaria. Microfilaria, good. Um, what's the diagnostic stage? The microfilaria in the blood. When are you going to take your blood sample from your patient? At night, right? That's when the microfilaria are circulating in the peripheral bloodstream. During the day, you guys, they stay in the core. They, they stay in the blood vessels within our core, right? And it's cool. They've evolved to come out into the periphery at night and because that's where the mosquitoes are mostly going to bite, right? The arms, hands, legs. Yeah, okay. Um, let me see here. So transmission is <coughs> mosquito, right? Mosquito-born. Where do the adults live in humans? Lymphatic vessels, right? What's the consequence? Blockage of the lymphatic vessels and we get the swelling, the edema. Right, good. Okay, good job, you guys. Um, is Wuchereria bancrofti a, um, a cestode, a trematode, or a nematode? Nematode. Awesome, you guys. Great. Now, in some of your micro A boxes, the blood smears, um, there might only be like one microfilaria in the blood smear. So if you're having trouble finding the microfilaria folks in your micro A boxes, I've got one, a nice one set up on the bench floor. Okay. And likewise, folks, we have. Fecal smears um, showing the Tania solium eggs and fecal smears showing the Ascaris lumbricoides eggs. So if you're having trouble with your, um, your slides, check out the demos so you know what you're looking for. Good. Okay. Um, and again, folks, this slide is just to show in different regions of the world, the Wukereri has adopted um, to be vectored by many different types of mosquitoes, right? So, folks, the last um, helmet we're going to do is another nematode. It's called Trichinella spiralis. And, folks, this is another parasitic worm that we can find in undercooked pork, right? And to me, this is fascinating, you guys, because a lot of cultures 
pork, you don't eat pork, right? That you don't eat it? And I'm like, that is so interesting to me because I wonder again, you know, I'm always trying to find a microbiology link. If just through experience, right, that maybe people learned that eating pork sometimes led to some of these diseases. And, and so, and I think there are some historians that have wondered likewise if, if the diseases associated with eating um, undercooked pork, right, may have contributed to the ban on, on eating pork in many cultures. I think that's fascinating. All right, folks, so with Trichinella spiralis, not only is it pigs that can act as a, as a, as a source of meat that could infect us, <laughs> but if um, you have friends or families that are bear hunters, Bears can also get infected, and in some, in some cultures, like walrus would be hunted, right? So walrus can also act as source of the trichinella spiralis. Again, you guys, the life cycle is fascinating. So let's say that we ate pork or maybe bear meat that had these little baby larvae. These are the little baby larvae, you guys, in the, in the um, muscle. And if we get them just right, when we do the cross section, they look like little cinnamon buns to me, these little spirals. I always love having food analogies to this. So it's because the larvae in the muscle, they form these little spiral shaped resting stages. This is where the spiralis in their name comes from, trichinella spiralis. So if we um, eat the meat with the larva in it and we haven't cooked the meat, the larva is still alive, passes through the stomach, enters the intestine, where the little larvae are released, they're gonna mature into uh, male and female worms. Um, there'll be sexual reproduction. And it's fascinating, you guys, the female doesn't lay eggs, she gives birth to live babies, live little larvae. And so then the larvae penetrate the intestine, get in the bloodstream, and are, are distributed throughout our body. They end up going to um, muscles, really active muscles, um, and there they'll form the little resting stage waiting to be eaten again, yeah? And as you can imagine, folks, if you have a lot of these larvae, it's going to cause inflammation. They're great big things, right? So even if they're killed, as they disintegrate, they're causing lots of inflammation. Um, there was one story of a postman who got infected eating undercooked bear meat. He presented with signs of a heart attack. They thought he was having a heart attack, but it was just the invasion of the larva into the diaphragm and other muscles involved in respiration. <coughs> and furthermore, you guys, because his, um, his skeletal muscles got invaded, he became totally disabled. He couldn't work anymore, right? So in heavy infections, this can be really bad news. Um, so again, folks, if, if you or family or friends um, are bear hunters, um, make sure that they know it's it's like pork. You gotta cook it really well. Never eat undercooked um, bear meat because again, they can be a source of trichinella. So a really good good question has come up in the past, you guys, and it's like, you know, why is it that pigs? You know, pigs have all these these parasites, and one reason might be that pigs, like humans, are omnivores. They'll eat plants and they'll eat meat. Yeah, and with trichinella. Often our reservoirs are rodents, right? And pigs would have no problem eating a rodent. So that would be one way the, the pigs get infected. Um, so other animals, you guys, like um, cows and sheep and goats are herbivores. They don't eat meat. So they're not going to have the same risk of getting infected, say, with, say, trichinella spiralis, right? And another way, folks, that pigs can get infected is traditionally here in the United States, if people are raising pigs, you know, you're always trying to save money as a farmer, right? So people would go to restaurants and ask them for their food scraps to feed to their pigs. And sometimes the food scraps would include um, raw pork, right, that hadn't been cooked. So feeding garbage or restaurant leftovers was a way that trichinella could be passed to pigs. So now the rule is if you're going to feed your pigs garbage, it has to be cooked high enough to kill the any of the trichinella spiralis um, larva in any of the meat scraps, right? So that's one way we're trying to control it. Um, I thought it was really fascinating. In Germany, the family I lived with, my host family, they said if they came to the United States, they weren't, weren't going to eat any pork at all because they heard that it was such a high risk for getting trichinosis is the name of the disease, right? So I was like, wow, worldwide we're famous for trichinosis, right? Okay, but again, folks, if you eat pork, never eat it undercooked. Make sure it's totally cooked all the way through, right? And so you won't get taniosolium, you won't get trichinella spiralis, right? Don't want any of those. Don't eat those. Okay. 
So, oh, in what you'll be looking at, folks, is um, thin sections through muscle that have been stained, and the little the little cinnamon buns larva are really easy to identify. It's a very kind of satisfying slide because it's really easy to see those spiral shaped larva in the muscle. Okay, folks. So I think what we're going to do next, we're going to go to arthropod vectors, and a lot of this will be review, but we have a few new arthropods to introduce. So folks, um, arthropod vectors, arthropods belong to kingdom animalia. Arthropod literally means jointed legs or jointed feet, right? So they have jointed um, legs. And instead of having an internal skeleton, they have an external exoskeleton um, that crunches if you step on it, like cockroaches. When you crunch, when you crunch a cockroach, I'm sorry you guys, I don't like cockroaches. But it's that exoskeleton that's uh, made strong with chitin that's crunching. Okay. Now there's two groups of arthropods we're going to discuss, and both groups are blood feeders. So one group belong to the, the what are called the arachnids. Arachnids include spiders and ticks. Ticks are the ones that we're going to focus on. And um, the second group you guys are called insects, right? Probably pretty familiar with insects. An easy way to distinguish an adult uh, arachnid or an adult tick from an adult insect is arachnids as adults have eight legs, insects as adults have six legs. So it's just a simple way to distinguish the two. So folks, what we're first gonna do is talk about ticks. Now ticks can vector many different microbial pathogens, but there's only one pathogen that I'm gonna ask you on the lab exam. And it's the pathogen that causes Lyme disease here in California. Does anybody know the name of the bacterial spirochete the scientific name of the bacterial spirochete that causes Lyme disease here in California. Yeah, we talked about it a long time ago in lecture. Borrelia burgdorferi, right? It's a spirochete. It's spiral shaped just like Treponema pallidum, the spirochete that causes syphilis. And it's fascinating, guys. If syphilis or Lyme disease is left untreated, long-term sequelae are kind of similar, okay? So let's do transmission, folks. So the vector is a specific type of tick. Here on the west coast, it's called Ixodes pacificus. So I would like you to know that for the lab exam too. The common name is the western black-legged tick. And here's an example of the western black-legged tick. So it is the vector of Borrelia burgdorferi that causes Lyme disease, right? So what happens is when an infected tick um, feeds on us, they inject us with the Borrelia Burgdorferi. If we're lucky, you guys, if we're lucky at the site of the tick bite, the Borrelia burgdorferi will cause what's called a bullseye rash. There's a central area of red, then a little clear area, and then another circle of red, so it's often called the bullseye rash. If you see that, run to the doctor because you need to be put on antibiotics. Remember, this is bacterial. You can treat it with antibiotics. The problem is, is if um, the infection isn't noticed, or the person doesn't have access to medical care. In chronic infections, the bacteria can spread to, to bone, to joints, it can cause arthritis, right? And in some people, long-term, it'll evade the central nervous system and cause potentially permanent neurological damage, right? So this can be a nasty one, you guys. The reason it's called Lyme disease is it was first identified here in the United States and um, Lyme, Connecticut, a bunch of parents in a community in Lyme were concerned because their kids were all developing arthritis. It's like, that doesn't make sense, a bunch of kids developing arthritis. So the parents kept pushing for the um, medical researchers to investigate. And so it was discovered it was this bacterial spirochete, tick-borne, that was causing all this arthritis in children. Yeah. So folks, it's really important if you like to go hiking, if you like to uh, backpack or camp, every night you should check all over your body for what? For ticks, yeah? If you can remove the tick within 24 hours, it takes 24 hours for the tick to inoculate you. If you can remove the tick within 24 hours, even if it has Borrelia, you shouldn't get infected. So doing a nightly tick check is really important. And be careful, you guys. Um, um, with Thanksgiving coming up, a lot of times people want to go hiking at Thanksgiving. This is a great time to pick up the infected ticks. They like to, along a pathway where humans or animals walk, if there's grass, dry grass along the sides of the pathway, um, the, li the, little, the little immature ticks, the ones that are the best at transmitting Borrelia, they're hanging 
they're, they crawl up on, the, on the, the tips of the grass and they're questing. They have their arms out here like this. What are they, what are they trying to find? Yeah, a human or an animal that comes by, yeah. And you can actually see these little tiny ticks, you guys. If you're careful, if you pick up the grass, you might see what looks like little poppy seeds. Yeah, those are the baby ticks. So be really, really careful. This time of year is a great time to pick up ticks, these baby ticks that can transmit Lyme's disease. Okay, let me see. And folks, I won't ask you about the derma center ticks. Just, this just gives you an idea that ticks can transmit a lot of different pathogens. So on our lab exam, folks, I'm only going to ask you about um, the vector for Lyme disease. And again, you guys, what's the scientific name of the, of the sorry, what's the scientific name of the vector for Lyme disease? Exodes pacificus. What's the scientific name of the pathogen that causes Lyme disease? Borrelia burgdorferi. Awesome. Is it a bacterium? Yes. Can it be treated with antibiotics? Yes. If the infection is left long term, you guys, chronically, can some of the damage be permanent? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? So that's why, you know, prompt treatment with antibiotics is really important. Good. <clears throat> oh, and this is just transmission. So you guys, so reservoirs here in the West, our reservoirs tend to be small mammals, ground mammals. Um, back East, the reservoir are deer. Right, but the natural history here in the West is a little bit different. Um, the Exodes specificus, they will feed on deer, but um, um, here in the West, again, it seems that the biggest reservoir are going to be the, the little um, small mammals um, like ground squirrels, chipmunk, maybe mice, for example. Those are the most important reservoir here in the West. And folks, Sonoma County is a hotbed, Mendocino County is a hotbed, Marin County is a hotbed for Lyme disease. So be careful if you're hiking there. Oh my gosh, you guys, and now like the king of all the arthropod vectors, mosquitoes. So one, one person described mos mosquitoes as flying hypodermic syringes, right? And they, the females feed on blood, so they're wonderful vectors. So you guys, now um, we're going to get a, a little bit more detailed here. So for some of these mosquitoes, I'd like you to know the genus name and then be able to identify maybe a specific pathogen they transfer. So you guys, with Anopheles, okay, this is how I would word it. So um, there's a couple of ways. So Anopheles mosquitoes transmit the protozoal pathogen, provide the genus name of the protozoal pathogen that we've studied. Plasmodium, awesome, you guys. In which disease does plasmodium cause? Malaria, good. Okay, good, you guys. Excellent. All right, and then um, this is another important genus of mosquitoes, the Aedes mosquitoes. Um, there's two species, you guys, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. I, I think what I do is just ask you Aedes mosquitoes, A-E-D-E-S, just in general. And folks, they are great at vectoring a number of viruses. So yellow fever virus, really disturbing you guys, Zika virus. Why are we so worried about Zika virus, especially if a person's pregnant? Yes, this is really disturbing you guys. So what happens if, if a person's pregnant and they get infected with Zika, and it's fascinating you guys, it can be by mosquito bite, it can be sexual, right? They've, they've shown that if a man is infected and he has intercourse with a woman, he can infect the woman, so it's sexual transmission too, which is so bizarre. So if the, if the pregnant mom gets infected, the virus can cross the placenta, so that's a third way to get infected, right? And the viruses love to grow in the baby's neurons, and so as a result, the neural development of the baby is going to be really suppressed, depressed. So the babies can um, be born with really severe neurological problems. In really severe cases, the baby's brain doesn't grow sufficiently. So when the baby is born, which abnormality would you notice? Small. small head, microcephaly. But they've even shown in babies born to moms that got infected with Zika, Zika even if their head size is normal, they're still de detecting neurological problems later in life, right? So to me, you guys, it's like we desperately need a vaccine. Zika belongs to the same family as the yellow fever virus. We have a vaccine for yellow fever. So it's like we really need a vaccine for Zika, yeah? 
And furthermore, just to, it's as, as if we don't have enough to worry about, they have just identified breeding colonies of Aedes aegypti here in Northern California. So remember, you guys, if we have the vector, we can always have the disease, yeah? So just be really, really careful, you guys, with mosquito <laughs> control. Okay, so Aedes can transmit yellow fever vir virus, Zika virus, dengue virus, chikungunya <laughs> virus, dengue and chikungunya like Zika are kind of emerging infectious diseases here in the United States. Bad news, you guys, with the 80s, mosquitoes <laughs> is they're described as daytime biters, right? So usually we think of mosquitoes coming out at night, but these guys will bite during the day and they're very aggressive. You know, some mosquitoes, if they're, they're buzzing you, you know, you're swatting them, you can kind of discourage them. But apparently, 80s are really aggressive. They won't give up until they get a good blood meal from you, right? Um, and just just tiny bit, folks, and I, I know you've probably seen this, but we have a fantastic Sacramento YOLO mosquito and vector abatement um, uh, district here. And you've probably seen the fight the bite signs out, right? You know, fight the bite. What can we do to reduce the risk of mosquito bites? And one simple thing, folks, mosquitoes need water to lay their eggs in. So if, if, you, if you live in a house, just go around, check out in your yard. Are there any containers out there that are filled with water, rainwater? That's a great place for mosquitoes to lay their eggs, and they have to go through developmental phases in the water. So if you can get rid of as much standing water around your house, that will reduce the mosquito breeding um, um, environments and should help reduce the number of mosquitoes you have around your house. Um, okay, 80s, and then folks, um, Culex, this is an important species here in Northern California, because Culex spreads a disease, a viral disease we definitely have here in Northern California called West Nile virus, yeah? So Culex mosquitoes, folks, they like to breed in the rice fields, right? The, the rice fields get flooded, they like to lay their eggs there, and they like to bite birds, and birds are the reservoir of West Nile virus. So they like to, to feed on birds, but if there's no birds around, they'll happily bite us and then infect us with West Nile virus. They'll also feed on horses, and um, West Nile virus in horses can be really serious, very, very serious. Um, and I think we have a, a, a life cycle on West Nile virus. We'll come back to that, folks. Um, it, it, it just, I just saw here, and this is one that's often hard for people to remember. So we talk about you know, Anopheles and Plasmodium. We talk about Aedes and all the viruses. Can you name a protozoal, not sorry, can you name a parasitic helminth, you guys, that's, that's vectored by mosquitoes? The Wuchereria, right, the lymphatic filariasis. So remember, there's even uh, parasitic worms that are transmitted by, by mosquitoes. And let me see, folks, if I've got a couple. Yeah, this is the West Nile transmission, you guys. So the natural transmission is um, uh, birds, mosquitoes, birds. Right? But again, if there's no birds around, the mosquitoes can bite horses. And again, West Nile virus is really serious in horses. Or it can bite people and transmit the West Nile virus to people. Um, horses and humans are called dead-end hosts for West Nile virus. And what that means is not necessarily that they're going to die, although sometimes they do, but it means that in the horse or humans, West Nile virus doesn't replicate to high enough numbers the concentration of West Nile virus in our blood or horse's blood is so low um, that if a mosquito bites us, that mosquito will not get infected with West Nile virus. So humans and horses are considered dead in hosts for the pathogen, right? They're not going anywhere once they get into a horse or a human. But again, folks, in horses, it can cause really serious neurological disease. And in some humans, too, you guys, it can cause really serious neurological disease. Yeah, they have a vaccine for horses to protect them <laughs> against West Nile virus, but we don't have a vaccine for humans. To me, that's so weird. It's like, I wonder if we could vac our, our, vaccinate ourselves with the horse West Nile virus vaccine, if that were probably not a good idea. Okay. <laughs> and then, folks, this is a, um, another vector we have here in California. And you don't need to remember the scientific name, you guys. Xenopsila chiopsis, this is the rat flea. Just, just know fleas. And the reason I wanted you to know about fleas is they're the vectors of Yersinia pestis. Which disease does Yersinia pestis cause here in California? Bubonic plague, right? So you guys, we definitely have bubonic plague endemic in California. 
It's maintained in small rodents like chipmunks, ground squirrels, um, especially in the Sierra Nevada. So again, if you're a hiker, camper, or backpacker, be aware. Don't lay your backpack down near a, a rodent burrow because there's the chance the rodent has bubonic plague and the, then the fleas are carrying it. And if the fleas bite you, you're going to get infected. It is bacterial, folks. So um, if, if you're if you're treated promptly with antibiotics, right, that can save your life. But often people aren't thinking bubonic plague, you know, in the, what, 21st century. This is, again, you guys, kind of life cycle. So the normal life cycle is, would be um, um, like rodents, small mammals, bit by fleas. The flea bites another infected mammal, and that's how it's maintained in nature. That's kind of its natural history. But especially as we're encroaching more and more on natural habitats, you know, building our houses there or we said camping and backpacking, um, those fleas, if we come into contact with the infected fleas and they bite us, that's how we get infected. And also folks of concern is that if um, you have pets, so let's say you're hiking with your dog, right? So the dog, the dog can get, um, the fleas can jump to the dogs. And a lot of us, like our animals sleep with us, you know, your dog sleeps in your bed. And that's what they're showing in this picture here. So the, the um, infected fleas could jump maybe from, from your dog to you and bite you and get you infected. There was a, there was a really tragic story up in the Sierra Nevada, uh, Sierra, Sierra Nevadas. Um, this was many years ago, but there was a woman that lived up there and she had a cat. And the cat got sick, right? And so, you know, we cuddle our animals, right? And the, the cat was sneezing in her face. Yeah, right? And this is bad news, you guys. So what had happened was, this is, this is what they think happened. The, the rodents, they will get sick, right? And they'll get sick and eventually die. Well, cat, out, outdoor cats are hunters, right? Or they like to play with rodents. So they think what happened was the cat found like a dead or dying rodent that was dying from bubonic plague. Is the body of the dead animal drops the fleas start leaving, trying to find a new warm host. So the cat maybe found the dead or sick rodent. The fleas jumped up, up onto the cat. The fleas bit the cat, injecting with the Yersinia pestis. And what happens, you guys, in bubonic plague, it can um, replicate and move into your lungs and cause pneumonic plague. So it's replicating in your lungs so that when the cat or you sneeze or cough, you're creating aerosols of Yersinia pestis. So they think what happened when the cat was sick with pneumonic plague, you know, and the woman was cuddling the cat, the cat sneezed in her, in her face, boom, Yersinia pestis, she inhaled it, and she died. Yeah, so be careful up there in the Sierra Nevadas, you guys, be careful. We've got, we've got bubonic plague. And then, you guys, this is total review. So um, any guess who this is? We've met this character before. Blood-feeding fly. Glossina, right? Glossina, and this is the vector for which protozoal pathogen? Trypanosoma brucei, right? And what's the name of the disease? African trypanosomiasis, right? Common name is sleeping sickness, right? Invades the central nervous system. Awesome, you guys. And this is another friend. This is Triatoma, right? The so-called kissing bug. And which protozoal pathogen does this transmit in the Americas? Chagas disease, right? Another name, American trypanosomiasis. What's the scientific name of the protozoal pathogen that causes American trypanosomiasis? Trypanosoma crucii. Awesome, you guys. So these, that's just a review, right? Okay. And then, now, you guys, um, Dr. Holland has some awesome demos up talking about lice, um, lice and bed bugs, right? Um, so you're absolutely welcome to look at those, but you guys, we won't have lice nor bed bugs on our lab exam. I'm, I'm going to leave them up because it is really fascinating. Um, in our family, you guys, when our kids were little, going to elementary school, we would always say we need to set an extra plate at the Thanksgiving table for head lice because every November the kids would have head lice. Makes me scratch my head just thinking about it. So anyway, you guys, so we got some head lice over there. They're dead. They're dead. They're not, uh, they, they can't infect you. But again, you guys, that's just if you're interested, right? Um, the only 
arthropods we would have are the ones that are on your worksheet, okay, the ones we've talked about. All right, so you guys, what I'm going to do, let me close the movie here really quick. And then up on the board, I'm going to put the list of slides that you will look at in the micro A box. So we'll have one person per team of 